Welcome back to the Ultimate Athlete Podcast, where we help you fix injuries, get flexible, and build a strong athletic body for life. In today's episode, I'm speaking with industry juggernauts Kelly and Juliet Starrett from The Ready State. Dr. Kelly Starrett is the co-author of the New York Times best-selling books, Becoming a Supple Leopard, Ready to Run, and the Wall Street Journal bestseller, Deskbound. He is also the co-founder of The Ready State, where he consults with coaches and athletes from the NFL, NBA, NHL, MLB, and the U.S. Olympic team. He also consults with elite Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, and Coast Guard forces, along with corporations on employee health and well-being. Juliet Starrett is an author, entrepreneur, attorney, and podcaster. She is the co-founder and CEO of The Ready State and the former co-founder and CEO of San Francisco CrossFit. She is also the co-author of the Wall Street Journal bestseller, Deskbound, and was a professional whitewater paddler, winning three world championships and five national titles. Together, this power couple is almost single-handedly responsible for starting the mobility revolution and influencing millions of athletes, trainers, and everyday Joes and Janes by helping them relieve pain, prevent injury, and improve performance. In today's fun and exciting interview, we talk about their new book, Built to Move, The 10 Essential Habits of Durable, Infinite Humans. So get out your mobility tools and prepare yourself for an incredible conversation with Kelly and Juliet Starrett. So welcome to the Ultimate Athlete Podcast. I'm excited to have Kelly and Juliet Starrett on the podcast. And I want to jump We're right obviously in. ultimate athletes. Let's be honest. We are ultimate, ultimate athletes. Yeah, well, having a machine. <laughs> Maybe penultimate. Uh, it's interesting because one of the first questions that I had for you um, relates to being the ultimate athlete or relates to being what your business name is, which is now the ready state. <laughs> And when I first knew you, you were mobility walk. And so I wanted to go back first and foremost, a little bit on your timeline to that pivotal moment where you went from big brand name. I mean, like industry leader, the big dogs, you changed your whole brand name. And I, I just want to know the backstory about why you did that and how that process was for you. Sure. Mm, me too. I'll, go um, ahead, Jay. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll start. I'll start on that one, even though I will. We'll see. Kelly, Kelly turns to me as though it was my idea, but it was his idea. Um, although, you know, it was a joint idea. Uh, it, it was a few things, I'll say, and it was a long process. It was a long time coming. Um, Just when, go ahead and try to change your name on your driver's license and let yeah, us know yeah, how that let, goes let, for let you. Let us know how that goes. But, um, you know, Kelly came up with the name Mobility Wad, I think in 2008 or 2009. And at that time, we were like, God, dang, we are creative and clever, aren't we? Like we took this term WAD, which was, you know, most people in the world didn't know what WAD meant. It was decidedly a CrossFit term workout of the and day. And there was no WAD. There was no anything. anything WAD. Like we were the first people to take a word and connect it to WAD and make it a brand. Um, and we are like so high-fiving each other. We're so clever. We're like, gosh, aren't we clever? And the um, word mobility wasn't used anywhere. Yeah. We So what one of the things that we were really excited about was trying to drop this old language of flexibility. Stretching. Range of motion, stretching non-specific and we wanted to take sort of redefine the category as a systems whole systems approach to having you be able to move through the environment that's what being mobile is so um that obviously served us well for a long time until we felt like it wasn't um and there were a variety of factors one of which we are alluded to. The first was um, from the time we became mobility wad to the time we switched to the ready state. I think it, we did some research. I think it was something like 500 other companies and brands had come up with blank wad companies, um, you know, and, and it was wide ranging. I mean, literally every sport from soccer to, you know, anything, yoga wad, you name it, there was a wad. Um, and then it even went so far as to, um, you know, there was faith wad where there was a daily biblical musing and sobriety wad where people could, um, you know, get resources on, on coping with or, or managing sobriety. And I mean, you name it, it blew up. Um, and so what happened there, and then there were also some other, um, you know, Ramwad is obviously a yoga company and GoWad came onto the scene that are they, you know, also doing mobility workouts. So we started to see some confusion in the market. Um, you know, for example, Kelly was once doing an Instagram live and he was on mobility wads, Instagram channel. And 
in order to get your question at, at answered, you had to do something like hashtag MWAD or hashtag mobility wad. And someone was like, hashtag ROM wad. And, and I really do think there was confusion in the market. You know, there are these brands and, you know, ultimately we're doing very different things, right? Like ROM wad <sighs> offers follow along yin yoga videos. And, you know, we do mobility videos and, and we just felt like there's a lot of confusion <laughs> in the market. Like we all of a sudden were like, well, what started off as this really funny, ha ha ha, clever thing that we created, created some confusion among our cu customer base. So that was sort of number no, one. No, no, if you're Porsche, and then your ROM portion. Right. It just, confusing. there was confusion. Um, the second thing is that um, the term mobility is not widely understood. Um, I think it has become maybe widely understood in, you know, but I mean, that's more really recent, like in the last three to five years. Um, it still was kind of a niche term. Um, and then on top of that, WAD was a very CrossFit specific term. And what we realized in 2015, between 2015 and 2018, is that our reach as a company had really, while CrossFit was the was the audience we started with and, and are, are obviously are and will always be kind of our core crew, um, we really started realizing that our tools and methods and products were reaching way beyond CrossFit. Um, and those people didn't relate at all to WAD as a term. In fact, it deterred some of those people because they're like, well, uh, mobility, WAD, WAD is a CrossFit word. I don't CrossFit. This isn't for me. So that was a sort of really simple thing. And then, um, and then add, I think, let me add that one of the things that Julie and I really love is that we work across, across just a mobility workout of the day. We didn't explain what we did and it wasn't inviting to people who wanted to have less pain or play with their kids or be recreational runners. And so really the idea was how can we get people prepared to live better physical lives in their and being ready for that. We had been talking about sort of the ready state as an idea. I found it in some of the notes I would be using back in 2000. So it was, it was already there for us and we felt very confident. Yeah. And we had, I think in 2018, I think, or 2017, we started the podcast and called it the ready state sort of as an homage to that idea that, you know, the goal here is to get your body to do, be ready for anything. And that's very wide ranging. I mean, that can be ready to garden as a 75 year old grandma, or that can be to compete in the CrossFit games as a 21 year old athlete. So I think it was sort of a variety of factors. I mean, there was competition in the market, there was some confusion. Um, we, and, and also we saw that we really did have products and tools that were universally applicable to anyone who was using their body, um, and needed to put some input back into the system. And so, you know, we started the process in 2017 and it took us almost two years to do it. You know, it's, it's, it's um, it sounds so easy, like change your name, but um, man, the large and small tasks that have to be done um, to make that happen, you know, like the behind the scenes, corporate level and the names of your you bank pay accounts. A price for it. And, I mean, if you want yeah. to stop growing on Instagram, change your name. Yeah. So, you know, and you do, yeah. we did, we, well, first of all, there were a couple of things. I mean, you didn't ask me this question, but it actually was from a, a customer standpoint was a much smoother transition. I think people understood it. They were already familiar with the name, the ready state, because we'd called our podcast that. And I, I don't know, I think it resonated with people. I think the ready state has a different meaning for everybody, although they all are similar meanings. I think it means, I think it automatically means something to people, even without it being defined. Um, and, but, you know, we did definitely pay a price. I mean, Instagram doesn't like you to change your name and they definitely throttle you. And, you know, they're, it's challenging. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, it's got to be done slowly and correctly with the right amount of communication. And, and but I will say we've never looked back. We could have been mobility. Yeah. Kids. We've never looked back. <laughs> well, coming from my perspective, you know, I, I've been following you for years and years and years and probably been one of the most, I, I, I tell people that I watched all of your original mobility wad videos on YouTube two or three times, like the first 500 oh. or something like that. <laughs> Apologize. We're for the so sound. sorry. We're, we're so we're sorry. So shaky. But yeah. they worked. <laughs> yeah, totally. But, and so when I saw you do the rebrand and I have an online business, so I know all of the broken links and backend stuff Ooh. that you have to change and, and all, and all, all the people, if you just go on, on YouTube and search, Kelly Starrett shoulder, Kelly Starrett hip, mobility wad shoulder, hip back, like all the stuff that people search for. I'm like, oh man, they're going to lose all that. Like, I, I hope it goes okay. But what's great about it is the, the ready stake that does actually more speak to what I see you talking about, which is much, much broader than just mobility. Um, you're talking about, you know, how to have healthier habits with your kids and phones and nutrition and everything. It's much, a much broader umbrella under which you can play. So um, that's cool to hear a little bit of the backstory. 
Um, I yeah, wanna... and, and I would just add the umbrella before you go on. The umbrella thing is exactly how we think of it. I mean, just from a business standpoint, we do so many things. I mean, obviously, one of the things we do is mobility content, you know, that we sell to consumers directly, but we also teach professionals and we have courses and content around that. And, you know, as you know, and we're going to talk about, we've written books and sell tools and products, right? So, so we have this very diverse op for offering from a business standpoint. And that's why we felt like the ready state offered us this bigger umbrella to be able to really do and talk about all the different and diverse things we're doing. I'm curious the, cause you've written several New York times, bestselling books, popular books, and they've, I've seen them go. Oh, from did we? Ca- I didn't even know. Ca- <laughs> yeah. Just a reminder. Uh, and, and, and the progression can be seen. It's kind of like your magnum opus, the supple leopard, and then these sort of niche specific for runners and water sports and sitting. And now there's built to move the 10 essential habits of durable, infinite humans. I'm curious if this came out of your personal curiosities as you're, you know, getting older, um, as you're thinking about longevity, durability, long lastingness, is this just a personal thing that you wanted to write or, and, or. Is this an attempt to reach a different audience? Is this intended at different people to normally talk to? This book comes out in April and our book agent actually called me, cold called me five years ago. And was like, I'm ready for you and Juliet to write this book. And we were like, we are not writing this book. <laughs> and um, you highlighted a lot of things. I'll let Juliet jump into some of the specifics. But in short, one of the things that 30,000 foot, if we say, how's it going? How are we doing in fitness at transforming society? You know, in our in the high performance vertical of athletes counting their macros and getting better movement in and getting blood panels, there is a an elite group of people who seem to be living better for more fulfilled. And the rest of it, we have not invited everyone. We we have abandoned most of them. And so, if we ask that question, less diabetic, I mean, fewer injuries, less depression. Well, we have to actually apply. I mean, literally choose anything in that category, and you'll see that the answer is we're not going. So that really begs the question there must be a different approach or what aren't we getting wrong? And then simultaneously, if high performance has been our environment, that's the laboratory and the test kitchen where we're, that is really the lab where we're trying to understand what good practice looks like and how people should work some of the best things in. We have to consummate that practice and actually apply it to science or apply that science backwards. Otherwise, it's it's not helping anyone. So that's really the genesis of our thinking. And then Julie can talk more specifically what we're attempting to do with this book. So, I mean, th- this may be sound so broad and uh, marketers would like fall over um, hearing this. But I mean, really, the goal of this book was it was for everybody. And that includes readers of The Supple Leopard as well. Um, you know, in, in some ways, it's almost like the forward to Supple Leopard, this whole book is. Um, as you know, Shane, as a fan and I'm sure reader of Supple Leopard, it's a, you know, 500 page complex textbook um, and isn't uh, as accessible to, we think, as many people as, as could benefit from the content in the book. And no, nor does it really take on the nuances. Like, how do you live? Yeah, yeah, and and I think a lot of a lot of these things we've backed into actually since we first published Supple Leopard, which are more of the lifestyle pieces that you know you mentioned earlier in this podcast, like sleep and moving and walking, and you know we've kind of backed into these things both professionally and personally. And I think you you hit the nail on the head. I mean, we're getting older and we're having to think about sort of our own health and our own lives and longevity and durability differently. So all those things have come into play with this book. But um, you know, the goal here is to. Uh, take out some of the noise from the health and fitness industry of which we think there's a lot and try to sort of offer really simple ideas about how you can take care of your body um, in ways that you can actually fit into a busy life. Because I think that's the other error we've made in fitness. You know, if you look at most health and fitness Instagrams, it would appear that, you know, the people who are are, are many of the influencers and leaders and thought leaders are pro- probably spending like, you know, five to seven hours of their day lifting and meditating and ice bathing. And, you know, the, the vast majority of the people can't do that. You know, they've got a little bit of time in the morning before they go off to work and a little bit of time in the evening. And so we're trying to say, Hey, look, not only can, not only is, can we wipe out a lot of the crazy noise in the health and fitness space, but you can fit 
some of these practices and habits into your life in really reasonable, accessible ways. So I think, I think we're at this point in our life where we're trying to say, okay, you know, we ourselves have figured out how to perform athletically at a high level. We have access to all of the fancy tools and products out there that can help us live better and ideologies. Um, And how can we sort of make that relatable and accessible to everybody? Because everybody who has a body wants to be able to move freely and live pain-free and often don't have the tools and can't sort of wade through all of the information in the health and fitness. And, you know, what we've really tried to do is to create 10 vital signs. This is not a book about diet and exercise. And this is not a book about which rope you take up Everest and what color, you know, crampons you should have, which is what we're arguing about. Juliet and I are saying, hey, let's rewild, help you rewild your body and get to base camp. What are the base camp behaviors? And the irony is the things that Juliet and I are talking about are the exact behaviors that create the foundation for elite performance. So we build all of those things. And I think everyone, once you, when you see the book, I I think it's our bus book, hands down. I just had to read some copy edits and I'm like, damn, I, this thing is awesome. And um, you know, it's the book, every physician, every physical therapist could give her patient. It's the book, every client said, Hey, I know you have an uncle who wants to get their lives and they don't need another diet and exercise book. They don't need another keto hack and 20 minute hit routine to get shredded. That's not what this is about at all. It's really about what we think are the 10 essential sort of foundational behavior, vital signs. And then also what people don't understand and that we understand, I think it will get a little glimpse of is how all of these things interact. Let me give you for an example, people get bad sleep. So because, because they're super stressed and maybe they had some alcohol before they went to bed and they stayed up late on their phone. So the next day, they those are, those are just self-soothing behaviors. The next day, they smash a whole bunch of coffee, right? Don't have a big drive to move. You eat a little bit more carbohydrates because you're looking for a fun bump and you feel better. And at four o'clock, you're exhausted. Have some, eat <laughs> have some more coffee. Eat candy, have some more coffee. And then by the time it's you have to deal with being able to shut down and turn off. You got to hit the brakes. And that's this alcohol depressant cycling that you can't see is coloring the quality of your sleep and starting to drive some of the behaviors in your life. For example, we think that preparing to sleep starts during the day where you're going to accumulate enough non-exercise activity, enough walking fatigue, we are actually tired enough to go to bed. That means that you have to think about how am I going to park my car or get in these movements so I can improve my non-exercise activity loading so that I actually can fall asleep and I'm exhausted. And we didn't say work out there. We said you have to move your body. Moving your body, it turns out, does a wonderful thing to load your tissues and decongest your lymphatic system. So if you're not doing some of these foundational behaviors, what we see is that the system isn't set up to be as robust as it could be. And if you don't walk, you don't sleep, you don't sleep, you don't, you drink more caffeine and hit the alcohol. And now we, Juliet and I are like, wow, we, we can't even tell what's going on with you yet because the sort of compounding, conjoining normal accident, this, this sort of, you know, problematic where we we pull at the Gordian knot and the whole Gordian knot gets tighter. So how do we simplify that for busy working people in really ways where they're not, we're not making giving them another checklist. Well, Mm -hmm. and and I think the other, the reason I wanted, I started by saying this book is for everyone, including readers of Supple Leopard. And part of the reason I say that is, you know, the habits and practices that were suggested in this book, you know, even the professional athletes and elite performers we work with, we see often are missing these basic habits. I mean, these are universal. Um, And again, it's base camp. And, you know, one of the things I like to say is like, hey, look, don't ask me if you should take X, Y, or Z supplement or follow this X, Y, or Z, you know, fancy, trendy diet. Um, You've got to check the boxes of being at base camp. And then if you are, then you can start to to do some of these more nuanced behaviors like supplementation and, you know, ice bathing and some of this more complex and less accessible stuff. You don't need protein and you don't have fruits and vegetables in your diet. We we have to, people need to start at base camp. And then if they're doing the habits at base camp, of which many professional and elite athletes are not, by the way, and and still are are things we counsel those folks on as well. Um, So, you know, we're really sort of obsessed with this base camp practice. Like you need to be at these, this base camp, and then you can iterate from there. Mm-hmm. And we've become so reasonable. I mean, I think 
long time ago, Juliet would be like, you need to row an X number of times. You should be able to run a mile and deadlift. Now we're like, well, did you get any sunshine? Did you hug someone? Did you go for a walk? Did you drink any water today? <laughs> oh, you're vegetarian. That's super cool. How many grams of protein did you get today? Because it turns out if you're trying to grow or heal and you're not hitting some protein minimums, it's going to be more difficult, period. Yeah, that's very exciting for me to hear because one thing that I've always appreciated about um, your methodology, your system in general is it's very systems thing. It's very, it's not just one little narrow lens on a tiny area. It's very broad. Um, and just as you go through life, you get better and better. I see it in your videos and my own methodology and system of distilling things into simpler and simpler layman's terms in a simple framework that almost anyone can follow. So this sounds like a book that I could give my mom or dad or, or anyone in my, one of my relatives, and they could have a framework from which to operate if they haven't seen all 500 of your videos three times over. Um, yeah. Or read all 500 pages of Supple Leopard. Exactly. That's exactly, that's exactly right. And, and that really is for us a chance to say, this is the promise of all of this experimentation that we've all been doing for the last human fitnessing. We have to distill those things back to match into what is required to be a durable person. And it's not more resveratrol. And it's not, you know, if I do this secret squirrel intermittent fasting program, it unlocks and if this vodka is gluten-free, we want you to go be a human being. And what you'll find is that you're a lot more tolerant and durable and can have even more fun in your life for longer if you just take care of the basics. And the basics, unfortunately, are free and not very safe. Mm -hmm. I, that's, you know, you know, it's really sexy going for, you know, what I, what I tell Juliet is I'm like, hey, J-Star, why don't, tonight, why don't we do some, mag like, Ooh. we want to go to bed early and we take some magnesium so we can go to sleep and trank dart ourselves. I mean, really, the older we get, we're like, wow, man, this is, uh, this is pretty amazing. But what ends up happening is when we take care of those things, we actually feel better. And yeah. Well, knowing that, you know, the devil's in the details. I mean, you, the, the big rocks, the, 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 I'm imagining that the big tests and practices that you give in this book, we'll probably touch on them just now, but um, how to actually implement them and turn them into habits and make them a lifestyle yes, over right. time is also an important part. But first, I'd love to hear you just touch on whatever you want to say about what are the big rocks? What are the main principles that you'll be covering in the book? Sure. I mean, we, um, you know, we've alluded to it already, but we talk about nutrition, although at a very high level sleep, um, some things we think a lot of people ignore, which are breathing balance, um, obviously, because we're all about uh, taking care of your body and tissues. There's quite a few uh, chapters about sort of your big body movers. So being able to move freely involves taking care of your hips and shoulders and ankles. Um, and Obviously, we're fans of walking, standing, moving, um, and we think that's essential and a missing, a big missing piece of a lot of people's lives. So, so what did I miss? Did I miss any? Big no, the, <clears throat> I think the key is that you alluded to this too. That if you took your busy life, and I said, in busy life, let's be granular. Here's a day, and you wake up at six, and you're gonna go to bed at ten, right, or nine thirty. Where are the places? where you're going to have any agency because the best program is defeated as soon as you implement it in the real world. Right. I mean, the best plans, best laid plans. I mean, that is, that's a, that's a meme for the best reason. And, <clears throat> you know, so Juliet and I, you know, I think what we want people to understand is that we have two daughters who run a business, we have friends, we have things that we are, you know, we're going fast and we are users of this thing. We, this isn't, this isn't some elite program that no one can relate to. You're going to be able to take and understand and integrate into your already amazing life. And I really just want people to recognize that they actually, you know, the body is so tolerant and so wonderful that you can get away with murder for a long time until you can't. And one of the foundational mistakes people make is that we can't think in terms of decades. That when, you know, when we were in my 20s, Juliet and I were both racing whitewater, we were paddling class five. We, I have a couple of friends who are like, man, I don't think we're going to live to 30. We had a lot of friends die in their 20s paddling these big rivers. There's no way I was like, what will my hip function be like so that I can go for a hike when I'm 50? Like that was not even in my, my scope of care. But all of a sudden we're seeing that if we can get these base behaviors in 
and start them early. And then they just become habits and they're just, it's easy. It's easy to do this stuff. It's not, I should say it's, it's, it's not simple or it's simple, but it's not easy, right? What you'll end up seeing is that you're setting, it's like compounding interest in the bank. And that by the time you are 30, 40, 50, 60, you can't actually reclaim the total potential. Of course, everyone can make change and the body, you know, we say muscles and tissues are like obedient dogs. But if you start playing this game, then we're really the back half of your life is really remarkable because I, I, you know, Julian and I, because we work in so many different fields across so many different cohorts of people, we see what happens when you break your hip and you're 80 and you have low bone density. That's a problem. So, but that's a problem that actually gets solved in your, you know, so how do we get people to think in these long terms? I don't know. And, and the, the other thing is, I mean, again, we're sort of obsessed with the idea of accessibility and that's what we're really trying to do with this book. Equity. Um, and you know, for example, I spend the vast majority of my day working on my computer. So, you know, I'm not, again, exercising for seven hours a day and getting massages. And I mean, that's not what my life looks like. So we're, we've really tried in this book to emphasize that like, we're operating like everybody else. We're not, we're not, you know, we don't have all this extra spare time to add in all these practices in our life. And we're trying to say, look, this is how we fit these things in. And it really is like a rinse, wash, repeat heat on a daily basis. Like it is not sexy. In fact, sometimes, you know, we're, we're working on, you know, making content to get ready for built to move. And sometimes Kelly and I are like, wow, this is so not sexy that it's boring. And how do we make it exciting for the internet world? Um, because it really is the same things every day, like focusing on sleep and, you know, breathing and walking and eating some protein and, and, you know, uh, you like know, here, taking care of our tissues. Like it really is, it's not super sexy, but it is, but what we're trading in sexiness, it we're gaining in accessibility and relatability. That's you know, our goal. We just we just got off this family river trip. We ran the Desolation Greg. It was a 90 mile trip. We happened to catch her at low water, which meant that we did a lot of rowing. And instead of doing it in eight days, we did it in six days because that's something. We did. So there were a lot of days where it's carrying, loading, schlepping, and then rowing six hours where Juliet would row a, if you've ever been on a rowing machine, like concept two, instead of damper 10, it's like damper 20 and your, and your seat's broken. So it's, and there's a headwind and there's a headwind. So it's gnarly conditions. And here we are approaching 50 out, you know, carrying, loading, and really sort of testing our fitness, keeping the idea that the reason we care about these things so much is that, so we can then go spend our credits doing the things we want to do and do them that we're not worried about tissue tendinopathies. We're not worried about, you know, am I going to, am I, is my rotator cuff going to fail when I yank on this? Or, you know, <clears throat> one of the things that Julian and I believe strongly in is a, an idea that's in the book from one of our friends named E.C. Sinkowski. And she has this thing called the 800 gram challenge. And if you want one behavior from this podcast, Julian and I, and our whole staff action, all our friends, we try to eat 800 grams of fruits and vegetables a day. So you're like, I don't like kale. I'm cool. Don't eat kale. But show me you can eat 800 grams of apples. You like apples? Yeah. Eat 800 grams. Like you're not getting enough micronutrients and you're not getting enough fiber. What you're eating is butter and steak. And yes, yeah, steak has a ton of micronutrients, but you're not getting the fiber and some of these other things. There is very, very low data to suggest that you can be unhealthy eating fruits and vegetables. And if you're carnivore, but you want to eat fruit, we're like, cool. You can eat a pound of cherries. A pound of cherries gets you over halfway over the mark, and that's 230 calories for a pound of cherries. Just knock yourself right out. So what we see is that in our worldview, that's a game we play every day where we're trying to eat fresh, frozen, canned fruits and vegetables. Doesn't matter. We try to choke all these things down. It's very fun to eat a pound of melon. Go for it. You're going to feel decadent. Bananas aren't going to kill you. And what we see is that game resets tomorrow. And then I get to play it again. And then I got to, I got to eat more fruits and vegetables and I got to sneak this stuff in. <clears throat> Notice that if you're vegan, we got you. If you're vegetarian, we got you. If you're carnivore, we're like, we got you. You know what, what we're seeing though, is that people think that they're leading, they're eating bars and they're eating processed foods. 
And by the time you get to the end of the day of eating 800 grams of fruits and vegetables and hitting your protein macros, there's just not a lot of room for things like, like cake and bagels. Like you just, you're stuffed. And so what's really nice is that we aren't big fans of pulling things out and restricting diets. We're fans of putting things in. We think that that's a much better way. But that's an example of sort of the boringness that we live by. We're like, oh, got to eat. I got to eat this whole, you know, package of blueberries today like oh that's that's too bad you know and when when you start viewing it that way suddenly you're like wow look at all the things i can eat it changes your worldview suddenly we're eating fruits and vegetables for breakfast part of our because otherwise you know we don't get to the end of the day and not hit our 800 gram challenge if we get 750 grams do we fail no but what helps us do is to have a vital sign, a minimum that allows us. And by the way, 800 grams of fruits and vegetables is a really reasonable, it's a reasonable amount of food. Like a gigantic grapefruit is like 300 grams. You know, an apple is 90 grams. Like you're suddenly you're like, oh, okay, it's not that crazy. Yeah. I like that because it also doesn't feel like I'm restricting myself. It doesn't feel like, oh, one more thing that I can't do now. One more thing that the professionals are oh, telling yeah. me. That's delete right. This, that, delete that. That's grapes awesome. are not the limiting factor to your human performance. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, I've heard you say on other podcasts, you talk about shaping the environment or constraining your choices to help you mm -hmm. do the things that you should do that are in your best interest that you know are good for you. And it's what I have spoke about as what I call inevitability thing. Like how can I create the, the conditions, my environment, everything around me to make me doing the thing that I want to do, exercise, sleep, eat well, how can I, it, the environment will practically make it inevitable for me to do that. That's and right. I've, heard, I've heard you talk about like, always having, um, you know, fresh chopped up fruits and vegetables available in your refrigerator at all times. And it's just like, if your daughters at any point are like, I want something to eat, you're like, go ahead. There's a whole smorgasbord of things there. And so it's like, it's, it, it's easy. You're like easing the path for them to make the right choice. So I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about shaping the environment and constraining your choices. Before Julia yeah. jumps in here, I just want to say that was it Monday or Tuesday, we were crazy. I grabbed a bag of beef jerky and Julia She's like, oh, I threw you a whole tray of strawberries. So my like main cut up, snack, already. Cut up already was strawberries and beef jerky. I crushed my lunch. That's what I had for lunch because I, that's all I could do. That was my meal prep. Julie had strawberries and this beef jerky. Just for everyone to understand. Like, yeah. So, I mean, you know, Kel, we, we call, we use the term constrained environment, but whatever, whatever it is, um, you know, Ke Kelly fondly likes to say, he's like, well, if there's cookies in the house, I'm going to eat cookies, which is true. You know? So, I mean, so, some of that stuff is about making sure we don't have the things we don't want to do around us because don't look where we don't want to go. Yeah. Like we're like any human, like we like cookies. And if they're sitting right there in front of us, we're going to eat them. Like we, you know, no, no one should think for two seconds that we're we're like masters of self-control. We're not because we don't believe in self-control. Um, you know, we're, we believe that human beings love cookies and are, you know, ultimately lazy people and love to Netflix. So, um, so, you know, we do this, I, I think I can give some examples of the way we do it. Like I put up a post a few months ago um, with a, another thing was pepper our environment, um, which is, I think another way of constraining the environment. But if you walk around like the main part of our house, um, you'll see that in our TV area, for example, you know, we're fans of sitting on the floor. Um, so we have these little mats that you can use to sit on the floor all around our TV area. There's like a plethora of mobility tools and balls and rollers and, you know, Norma Tech boots. And, and then if you go over to like my home standing desk, I have um, a slack block uh, balance thing. So I can balance while I'm on my standing, working at my standing desk. And, you know, same thing at our office. One of the ways we've constrained our environment, in our office is all of our desks are standing desks. So yes, as you see, Kelly's sitting on a stool. We're not like, Hey, all employees, you have to stand the entire day, but you know, our environment is set up so that the default is to be standing while you're working, or at least standing part of the time while you're working or perching against, or the perching stool. against your stool, right? Juliet's like standing said, this whole time. There's no, there's not a single sitting desk at our office. It's not an option because, you know, if you need to sit, you can take a break and sit on a stool. That's totally fine. But default sets you up to be able to stand for most of the day, if that's what you choose. Um, and then, you know, this fruit cutting thing is a thing I think is so funny. I actually have to give um, Margaret Garvey, who's a ready state employee. Many people already know, cause she's in a lot of videos with Kelly and, um, and I have to give her credit for this, but you know, I learned from her and from seeing her fridge that literally if you have fruits and vegetables cut up already in your fridge, kids especially, but I mean, not just kids, kids and adults too will eat them. Um, if I just put a melon in my fridge 
My kid is going to never eat it. And I mean, even it goes as simple as if you buy a bag of grapes, if I literally take the grapes out of the bag and put, wash them and put them in a bowl, even with no lid or anything, and then put that bowl in the fridge, the grapes get eaten. If I leave them in a bag, seven days later, I find I'm throwing them away at the end of the week, like so many people do with all their produce. So there's just these little ways that we constrain environments. You know, we make sure we have vegetables and fruits in the house, but we don't just buy them and then throw them away. We make sure that they're like set up. So I do usually spend half an hour and every Sunday and I do, I don't do any other meal prep. I'm anti-meal prep. If you want to ask me about that later, but the one thing I do do is when I unpack the groceries, I try to cut up as many of the fruits and vegetables I can so that they're easily accessible and we'll grab. So, I mean, there's 20 different little small and large ways in our life that we're trying to constrain our, um, because again, we're creatures of habit. We don't want to have to think all the time and make, and so if those things are just set up for us. They're like the standing desk. We're going to do it. And constrained behavior actually comes from physical therapy or actually comes from occupational if they first learned it. If someone had a, like a cerebral vascular accident or stroke, um, they might be have a deficit on one side of their tendency is if suddenly I can't use my left hand, I'll do everything with my right hand. But what constrainment therapy means is that I'll actually constrain my right hand less affected and I'll force my more affected side, the side where I had more the accident, to do all the work. And I make so that I don't have a choice. I have to do that. So that constraint therapy is how we came to think about, you know, you know, if I don't want to be doing, you know, eating cookies at two in the morning, don't have cookies at two in the morning in the house, then you just can't eat cookies. Yeah. I think that's one of Berardi's rules. If, it, if it's in the house at some point, you or someone you love is going to eat it. <laughs> I, I love that. I, I wish I could see uh, somewhere like a long list of all these little constraints or tips, tricks, hacks, because I've heard them in, in many of your videos. You know, I heard Kelly talking about sort of stacking the habits of walking your 10,000 steps or whatever and incorporating a breathing practice. And I was like, that's brilliant. And, and I've heard all these other little tips and tricks that um, from, from years back. But you can about. see all of those things April 4th when Built to Built Move, to move comes, comes out. out. You'll, you'll see that it's all in there. And you're absolutely right. Not only do we have breathing in there, and walking, but we have some eye motion and some sort of vestibular stuff. And we've got all of that in there because that's exactly right, is that we have to give people, we can't continue to give people a laundry list of stuff they have to do. We want to create the environment where yeah, like the, I have to just say, I mean, I mentioned it before, but like the balance, the, the having these little balance tools around a standing desk, like to me, that's like one of the coolest things that I, do. because I'll be honest, like I'm never probably going to be like, okay, for the 15 minutes before my workout of which I only have one hour to do, I'm going to do all this balance work and I'm going to spend this time, you know, like when I have one hour to work out, I want to like breathe hard and sweat and lift weights. Like that's what my, I'm motivated to do. I don't want to waste that very limited and valuable time I have doing like you know, balance training or whatever, but I've been able to incorporate it into my life literally because I already had an index set up and I put some balance tools around. And again, we pepper our house with balance tools. We always have, you know, we have skateboards and um, balance boards in our garage. So we have a slack line in our slack backyard, line in our backyard, like it's just, we've peppered our environment with this stuff so that it, that, and also think of a lot of this stuff. I, th I think the other thing that's lost too, is like a lot of this balance work and you know some of this other stuff is like also a form of play like it's fun and we forget as adults that like we also like to play around and learn new skills and suck at things and so you know it's fun to like walk into the garage and be like okay well I'm putting my life at risk here but I'm going to jump on the balance board and see how I do today um or you know just and we have we have those slack blocks in our kitchen so it's like I'm chopping vegetables right now I'm going to practice my balancing while I'm but chopping vegetables it also shows that one of the problems most of our modern base have become Come shaped by our work and we're very austere, very 90 degrees. And there's just only a few moves. And so much of what we're trying to do is ask ourselves, do I need a vitamin for that? Or could I eat? Do I need another skilled intervention or can I go play Frisbee or ride my bike? And I think that's one of the issues is that we continue to break down as a natural effect of just having access to this information. Well, I don't need to eat a calcium rich diet. I'll just take this calcium chew. Right. And, and so what we're asking ourselves is how do we expose our body, these things in a way that isn't some formal process. Process. You know, like you need direct sunlight in your, on your skin and in your face and in your eyes every day. So why don't you do that when you walk in the morning, you know, and, and, you know, 
I think when you start to view it that way, then, you know, suddenly Jill and I are like, do we need to do a lot of eye training? Well, I just rode my mountain bike down this hill, you know, we just play Frisbee. Like, I'm not sure I need to work on convergence and divergence here. Right. Because I'm turning my head and trying to balance. And I just did that on a, on a mountain bike ride. So how can we get out of the gym and out of the formal medicalized system of trying to have all of these regimented inputs like movement vitamins stop doing that let's get back to did you sit on the ground man if you sit on the ground for 20 or 30 minutes a day you're gonna do a lot towards resetting your hips normalizing your hip function and you know what you were doing sitting on the ground like you didn't have to do another thing just watch tv while you're sitting on the ground yeah and i mean i will start i will also add that i am a fan of technology and of the two of us i i like track everything and i'm the one with all the fitness apps and whatever but but you know the other thing we're we're trying to say here is men like you don't need an app for that like you know you don't need a con- app for your eye practice like go ride a bike or do something that will like fill up your soul in addition to also giving you that kind of cool training that we need so i, I think sometimes again we sort of like lost our minds thinking we you know all, all of this technological help and support and support help and support when it's like, just eat a vegetable and ride your bike a little bit. And and yeah. on top of that, those things would fill you up emotionally and psychologically, which I haven't even talked about, but. Um, you know, Juliet and I have a, yeah. we're lucky enough. It was one of our life goals to have a sauna. That was like literally like one of our couple's goals. Like, what do we want to do? I want to have really nice children and have a 401k and retire in a sauna. And, uh, you know, is the sauna great for our brain and our cardiovascular health? And so we can activate those shock proteins. And You know what we love about the sauna? There's no tech. We chill out. We get to hang out. We listen to a podcast and we like feel like we're a couple in the sauna and we sleep great. Or we, you know, we have, we have this thing, you know, we call fire and ice with our friends. Like we have some friends over and we sit in the sauna and nobody's on their phones and you're facing each other in the sauna and you actually interact and relate to one another as humans and look each other in the eye and check in and see how people are doing. And, you know, and so, I mean, yes, it, there are a myriad of well-known and well-researched health benefits of sauning. Like that's awesome. But in our life, what we've learned is the real benefit of the sauna is the relational benefit and like the emotional psychological benefit of just taking a moment and and again relating. it's one of those things where we are running 100 miles an hour and suddenly we just hey let's go sauna after dinner boom, hits the brakes and we're done we don't have hmm. to talk about what's your down regulation practice Juliet? well i get it i get really hot and it makes me exhausted and then i get to go to sleep that's my that's my practice so that's what we're trying to do is continue to simplify behaviors everyone's going to eat food everyone's got to walk around a little bit let's just tweak these things so that you can integrate it into your life in a sustainable way and what we know is that it turns out to always practice yeah a lot of the things that you're talking about have um come into my life in an unexpected way when I moved mm-hmm. to Columbia three years ago, about two, a year and a half or two years ago, we moved to rural countryside Columbia, a little town called Barichara, and we don't have a car. I now walk to get my groceries like 30 minutes every day, or if I want to walk to the local track, they call it a polideportivo. It's like a very rustic track. <laughs> um, it's like three, four miles away. And then I have to walk back after I do my track play time and or playing ultimate frisbee and so i'm automatically getting sun nature friends time um you know well, you work on decongesting and calming walking. down after your recovery but oh, no, I get home. yeah exactly i don't have to add a new formal practice to my already eight hour long movement and mobility practice it's just unstructured free nature play friend time and it's way more sustainable and motivating um, than it used to be for me where I was always trying to add, okay, and I need another routine and another routine and another routine. So that's it's right. cool to hear you talk about that. Death by routine. To, I love it. <laughs> I'd love to hear you talk about the mental emotional side of things. Juliet kind of alluded to it. Um, what do you guys recommend or do you meditate? Do you do breathing practice? What are your, what, what's the mental emotional uh, side of becoming a durable? Well, I, I remember I was at some kind of like health and fitness conference years ago. And I remember someone put up this chart, which has always stuck with me. And it was sort of like what health habits um, have the most impact on longevity and durability and far and away above all the other practices that we think about in our industry, like sleep and exercise and nutrition was 
having a strong community and friends around you and, and family and like close family, like a tight family connection. So, so all those sort of relational things I was talking about before, you know, I think that really, I, I realized at that moment that I was like, oh, okay, like those things are gonna positively impact my mental health and, and, and physical health. Um, and, and so I think one of the things, you know, we aren't really meditators. Um, I always feel like I should meditate, although, um, I'm the, the older I get, I'm, I'm more and more dropping the, I should, um, sort of philosophy when it comes to my health. I, I'm really trying to let go of that. Um, but you, you know, exercise but, regularly. Yeah. But I mean, I exercise regularly and for me that is, and always has been a big part of my sort of mental health. I, I am definitely a bit of a high strung person. One of the ways that I, I, I sort of like, you know, let that go a little bit. And, and it is, you know, is one of the few places in my day where I'm just doing that. You know, I'm not usually thinking about my to-do list and having sort of crazy brain the whole time that I'm exercising. Like I really can't focus exercise. Um, you know, I, for me, it's interacting with my family and being close with them and having a tight, close relationship with my husband. And, you know, we have amazing friends, community around us. And that also, I think, fills us up and bolsters us and mentally. Um, and then I think the only other thing that sort of would fall into that is we do really enjoy the sauna. Like that is this sort of moment for us where, you know, for, for me, that would be like the closest thing I have to meditation, you know, sitting in there tech-free thinking my thoughts or relating to the people I love and having a moment. So one of the things that I think that we do a good job of is we actually are exercising. For example, Juliet trains some friends who are coaches, dear friends. And then Juliet and I do a lot of like... We, we, one of our rules is we won't pick up a new sport with that because it's too divergent. Our lives are so busy right now. Maybe when our kids are gone and you're so tired. And you want to take up skydiving? I'll pick up skydiving and you're out. <laughs> but you, Juliet and I ride our bikes together and we do things together. So that culture, you know, we have a bike club we founded called the Failed State Bike Club. And we, every Saturday, you know, we get six to 10 people go and we ride our, you know, mountain bikes in our hood and we're, those are the kinds of things where we want to do stack those behaviors. Um, one of the things that I think people forget when we're talking about that psychoemotional health is you have to take care of the body in order to create a, a readiness for that thing. One of the things that if you want to improve your interactions with your family, the whole protect everyone's sleep. If you want to like really shortchange yourself and create a sensitive twitchy interaction with a whole bunch of people. You're not having a good time. Just be a little bit sleep deprived. <laughs> Let me know how that goes. So we want people to understand that this is a continuum. Uh, you know, I heard someone recently say, if you spin a coin, you can see both sides of the coin at the sim simultaneously. That is, you have to have this top down approach. Who are my friends? Where am I spending time? Where are my family? How do I feel like a human being? My brain is only a brain if it's relating to other, right? That is what we are designed to do. Brains. And then simultaneously from the bottom up, I need to create a readiness for my, my brain to be able to go to have those meaningful interactions. And so we want to do, you know, top down and bottom up simultaneously. And I think when we people take that approach, it ends up being a lot less complicated. You know, you, you don't, you don't need a, I don't need to set up a, an official time to say, have fun with my wife four to five. And, and I cannot put a finer point on the sleep thing. In fact, I think all those other habits I said about my mental health are trumped completely by sleep. Um, and the example that I like to give is that, um, you know, Kelly and I, I'm sure have made a thousands of mistakes in raising our kids. And people are like, oh, you guys are such great parents. Like, you know, we want to follow in your, you know, follow in your footsteps and tell us what your secrets are. And we're like, okay, wait, this is an ongoing experiment. And like, talk to us when our kids are 25. And then we'll tell you whether like we, you know, like we messed them up or it was, How or things went we well. So like, up? So like we're in the middle of the experiment right now. Like we, we can't, we don't necessarily feel like we can give a handout advice, but I think one thing that I do feel like we did well when our kids were very small was really protect their sleep and teach them how to sleep and teach them to value and care about sleep. Both of which they can do now, you know, they fall asleep easily. They sleep well, they can sleep long. Um, they, they appreciate they the all importance of sleep. And, and when they were little, people would be like, Oh, wow, your kids are so well behaved and they don't ever seem to have tantrums. And Kelly and I would kind of laugh to ourselves because we literally Literally, we're like legit has zero to do with our parenting of any kind. Like it's just because they're well rested. Like, and once you have a well rested kid and you go into the grocery store, 
store and you see a kid having a tantrum, it is like, oh, you're like, oh, oh, that's a kid who didn't take a nap or didn't sleep enough or stayed up too late. Or I mean, it's just, it's one-to-one. Like the kid having a tantrum in Safeway is the unrested kid, period. Like always. So totally, totally. Sleep, sleep. We can't, and we, we can't and we really do enough. sleep. You know, we really shoot for eight and a half hours of sleep. That's sort of our magic number for us as we've discovered. But that means we're in bed over nine hours. And sometimes I can sleep a little bit longer than Juliet can, but it's a half hour or so. And again, we plan Look how on, big you are, though. <laughs> that's true. You're not wrong. And, uh, it, you know, we add in another hour. So if you're going to bed, we want everyone to understand that if you got seven hours of sleep, pat yourself on the back. You just did minimum viability of survivability. And you actually didn't get to sleep. You went to bed at 11, got up at six. That's in the sixes. But you spent a half hour waking up, going pee, turning over. So understand that somewhere between a half hour and an hour of your sleep is not sleep. You don't, you know, and we want you to get eight hours minimum. And if you're trying to change your body composition, grow, heal, or learn a new skill, you need Get out of eight pain. hours of sleep. If you, you're struggling, Plus, if you're struggling with your mental health, I mean, there are so many things that go downstream of that. That's like, you know, and I do, by the way, think that sort of mainstream medical community is starting to, is starting to gotta catch be on for to this. Nine hours you know, to I mean, eight hours. there's so much, uh, and COVID was obviously horrible for kids and teenagers alike. And, you know, and I am hearing more and more stories stories about sort of mainstream medical practitioners and psychologists, you know, folks who are having mental health challenges actually, you know, starting to bring in the sleep conversation. That, that community is also realizing that like, what are we even talking about? Like, are we talking about massive extreme sleep deprivation or depression? Like, what is it? What are we talking about? Yeah. And it may be both. So let's it go ahead and control what we can control. Yeah. Amen on all that, because I remember um, I was at a Perform Better Summit. I think Kelly was presenting at that summit too. But there was another speaker who um, said a one-liner, which always stuck with me. He said, sleep is the closest thing that we have to a magic pill. We're all looking for the magic pill for everything. We found it. It's sleep. <laughs> Just sleep more. And that helps pretty Amen. much everything. Yeah. And, you know, I think, um, again, we've turned sleep into this, like, horrible routine that, you know, you have to practice to become a good. You know, Juliet and I aren't teetotalers, but, man, you know, we stopped drinking in earnest recently, a few years ago, I don't know, because not for not for any moral reason, but we were like, holy crap, we sleep like crap if we have a drink. So instead we were like, man, we, why don't we drink when we're rested on vacation at, at parties? And the rest of the time we'll save that because I don't think I can take it because it wrecks my sleep so much. So, you know, when you start to view everything around that way, then suddenly it ends up being sort of a, a key algorithm to understand what's going on. And, and again, these behaviors and built to move, you'll see they all stack up so that you fall asleep and black out. Literally, I'm asleep within a minute. I put my eye mask on. I'm like, I want to fall out. And, uh, you know, we have trained ourselves to have a kind of a sleep routine so that our brains know what happens. And if you've ever had a little kid, you know that, you know, you take a bath and have chill time adults. And, you know, you're going to go through periods of your life where your sleep is crap. You have a sick person in your family, you have a child, you have a deadline. It's okay. You're tolerant. Then you just have to be like, I got to get this back on. And so instead of smashing myself over on, I just control what you can control and then make the next best decision. Vision. What you'll see is that when you aggregate that over and amortize that over decades, you know, one of the uh, persons that we really like and respect recently had a post that said, you all aren't going to like this, but the thing you all need is consistency. And I'm not talking about a month. I'm not talking about two months or three months. I'm not talking about a juice cleanse. He's like, you need decades. And I think when you start to wrap your head around decades of consistency, you're like, oh, okay. I start to understand. Yeah. That's a whole different game and a much more realistic game and something that I try to represent to myself all the time. It's I'm developing, like I'm, I've learned Spanish recently and I even got slipped in the trap of like, if I can learn it in six months and then six months pass and it's like, <laughs> no, you can now order a coffee in Colombia, but you can't have a conversation with a group of natives. This is a five, 10 year game we're talking That's about right. here. That's right. That's right. Um, I know. I know how to... I I know how to like eat, eat the strawberries. That's what you learn how to do, you know? And, uh, and that's okay. I know I, when we look at human and we think about how to be in the world, all we need to say is, Hey, I just want you to be a more skilled human. You don't have to get it perfect the first time. You just need to keep, what you'll see is by the time you're 50, you're like, well, I'm actually maybe, you know, 50%. I'm getting, I'm getting a D now. I'm getting better. See you when I'm 60. That ties in with something that I, 
I think I heard you say another time, which is the glacial pace is the breakneck pace, Whew, which is an, another way of saying the old, like be the tortoise, not the hare kind of approach, <laughs> which is what we're tying into. And so I imagine, you know, people are going to read this book and they're going to say, okay, maybe I'm doing some of these things. Maybe there's definitely some new things that I'm going to try out. Um, how to uh, represence yourself to this is a decades game, be the tortoise, not the hare. Is there anything that you've seen in the people you coach, your, your, the people you live um, near that has helped them switch the chip from instant fix magic pill to, oh, this is a decades long game? I mean, I think part of it, and I think in my own personal life and practice is going back to what I mentioned before, but it's, it's sort of letting go of that, like I should, and also the, and I think this also is part of the mental health piece of this too, because, you know, at some point I think like taking care of our health has become this negative for so many people, because it's all about what I can't eat. I should have done that. And it's, it really is this sort of negative cycle. And it's really just trying to turn that back around and say, Hey, look, like Kelly and I traveled to Europe and we got four hours of sleep every single night. Like, and we didn't beat ourselves up about it. We're like, this is our reality right now and function as well as we can function on four hours. We're going to catch up when we get home, you know, kind to oneself and saying, Hey, I, I'm not going to be perfect. We all have, you know, because of technology, easy access to crappy food and, you know, all these challenges that we face as modern humans, we're all going to be faced with those things. And we're all going to fall down on our face. We're going to have day too much and eat the wrong things and don't get enough sleep. And I think it's all just being kind to yourself and just saying, okay, well, you know, I can this next meal or this next half day or this next day or five days, I can, you know, make some better choices and then fall off the wagon again. I mean, I think part of it is just about accepting that that's how a long cadence of health is going to look like is acceptance that, you know, no one's going to be perfect and you don't have to be actually. Yeah. It ties into, I have gotten really big into meditation in the past 10 years, and it's a, a big part of my life, but there's a lot of woo-woo spiritual language in the meditation world. And I've been listening to one teacher lately who, um, his teaching is basically like, as you're meditating, you're trying to like observe what's happening in your mind and emotions and in your body, the physical things in your body. And don't take it personally and don't make it a big deal, which is another way of saying like, be kind to yourself. Um, and so I really resonate what you were, what you were saying there. Um, I'm curious if there's any last things that we didn't touch on, um, about the book or about what you guys are passionate about, about your mission in the world these days, anything that we didn't talk about that you want to touch on? I think so. I mean, we are so excited about this book. I mean, we feel like, um, you know, I can't remember the word you used to describe simple leopard, but we, it's going to be that. And then some, mm. um, and this is just the beginning of starting to get the message out about, about it. And, and, you know, ultimately, uh, we hope that it changes, you know, changes how people view their health and makes, makes being healthy and happy, not a chore and simple and fun and playful. And yeah, nice. dude, I don't know what she said, but I just want to ride my mountain bike more. That's what I'm living for. So, <laughs> you know, I was, I have two daughters going to be playing water polo on the same team this year at high school. I can't wait. Uh, you know, look, we are very lucky to be doing the work in the field that we really, really like. And it's taken us a long time to amass the incredible cadre of friends and allies. And together, I think, let's look back in 10 years and say, hey, were we able to affect any change? Did anything change? You know, maybe it's happening, but it's hard to see because we're in the middle. Yeah. Well, I can tell you from one person's perspective, you definitely changed my life and my career path and my family's life and all the people that I've um, Sorry about that, everybody. Influenced. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm super stoked about this book because it sounds like um, a kind of book that I could give out to all of the people um, in my life that aren't as nerdy about this stuff as I am. Just want like oh, yeah. something yep. more plain speak. Um, so thank you so much for being on the podcast. And where can people find out more about you? We are at the ready state on all the socials. Um, if you want to see uh, some insight into my boring my boring life and our boring life and constrained habits, you can follow at Juliet Starrett and we're the ready state.com on the web. I'll give that a double plug because I actually do follow you and the content that you've been posting, which is like the behind the scenes about these little seemingly small things that you and Kelly and the family do um, to, they might seem to you like completely obvious and duh, we've been doing that for so long, but to a lot of people they're like, oh, wow. Like I never really thought that chopping up the strawberries and putting them in a bowl versus having them right next to it in a bag would actually make a difference, yeah. but it totally does. So go follow. Julia My wife's a genius. Well. Thank you. Thank you.